this tutorial video we are going to have a more in-depth look at suspension tuning. Your suspension tuning basically affects most stats in the game. It is vitally important that you have the correct setup for what you are aiming to do. And that can vary a lot depending on which market you are catering to or if you want to drive it out on the track in BeamNG Drive. As we need to start somewhere, let's start with handling itself. How your car handles during cornering is described in the steering graph. And what this graph shows you is your steering angle versus how much the car steers as a response to that steering input. This response is the yellow curve. While the blue line marks the optimal drivability setting, the red line marks the optimal sportiness setting. Up in the graph, is oversteer, down in the graph is understeer. In order to make a car as sporty as possible, you want to place the sportiness marker on the red line. In order to make the car as drivable as possible, you want to place the drivability marker on the blue line. Understeering setups usually are more favorable to drivability than oversteering setups. The main way to influence this graph is not via suspension tuning, but rather via wheel sizes. The car we are looking at here has a weight distribution of 53 to 47. It being heavier in the front and having the same tire size, front and rear, 2 or 5 mm wide tires does mean with the additional weight on the front that the car will be somewhat understeery. And we can see that in this graph. That is for neutral suspension setup, of course. If we increase tire size in the front, we will end up with a car that has more grip in the front and will oversteer more. This is with 225 tires, and as you can see, the yellow line is just escaping upwards and terminally oversteering. That is not a good thing to happen to your car. As you can see there, the third yellow warning tells you the car terminally oversteers, and that is never really good. As you can see, all the stats are quite negatively affected by the setup. This is neither advantageous to drivability nor sportiness. The same effect can of course be achieved by making rear grip lower. So if we lower tire size in the rear, we will end up with the same thing, more or less. If we want the car to be more understeery, for example in order to get the drivability marker onto the blue line to make it perfectly drivable, then we would increase rear wheel size. As you can see here, I now increased it by 20 mils in the rear and we are very close to this blue line. These values up here, the percentages, do give you an indication for how close you are actually being to the line. Before you do any suspension fine tuning, we recommend that you use a preset setting, for example normal, and then go ahead and tune your wheel sizes so that you are in the ballpark for what you actually want. Then you can come back here and do all the fine tuning. It will have set up the suspension to be somewhat in the ballpark of what you need, if you have chosen the correct preset for what you need. So first things first, camber. What does it do? Well, the more camber you have during cornering, that will increase grip on that axle. If we increase negative camber at the front, that means that we get more grip. More grip in the front means less understeer. More grip in the rear, less oversteer. Important to note here is that for common vehicles you probably don't want to go too far for your camber settings because the uh, angle of the tires means that they are going to be used asymmetrically and that increases your tire wear and thus service costs. A good range to use for normal boring passenger cars would be 0 to 1 degree of negative camber and for sporty cars more in the range of 1 to 2 degrees of negative camber. If you want to do an all out track monster well you can go up to 3 degrees but there are diminishing returns too so keep that in mind. Camber is a perfect way of fine tuning this number for drivability or sportiness exactly to your liking because of how little it changes if you increment it by only 0.1 degrees. Like this for instance. Now we have the supposedly perfect drivable setup. Before we get into springs and dampers, let's quickly talk about the sway bars because they have a similar effect. Sway bars will keep the car from rolling in that axle location. And that will mean that you will get less weight transfer on that axle, the stiffer the sway bars are. 
more weight transfer, more grip. If that more grip is in the front, then we know it is less understeering. So if we reduce the sway bar to zero in the front, you can see that we are having a much more oversteery or neutral setup in this case. But of course, body roll is something that you don't necessarily want too much of, like 12.7 degrees. You're not on a boat, but it feels like it. Good ballpark figures to use are around 7 to 8 degrees for vehicles that really need a lot of comfort and uh, passenger cars around 6 to 7 degrees, sports cars around 5 degrees and absolute hyper and super and track cars around 3 degrees. Also note that adding a sway bar obviously also increases the car's weight. Not by much, mind you. But um, if you're trying to minimize weight, you might want to keep the sway bars down a little bit. And now we finally get to the actual suspension part of the suspension, the springs and dampers. The stiffness rating of the springs determines what kind of ride frequency you get. The harder the springs, the higher the ride frequency. That means that the car oscillates quicker after driving across a bump. This is the bump graph and that one will help you fine tune what you're doing here. If we make a very stiff setup for the springs, then you see that the oscillations become a lot quicker. If you make them a lot softer, then the opposite is the case. And here we don't even see the oscillation anymore. But what is a good value for these oscillations? Well, you can have a quick look here for reference. And this one tells you that around 1 hertz is pretty good for comfort, around 1.5 hertz for drivability, and 2.2 hertz? supposedly the optimum for sportiness. That is of course some rather arbitrary numbers and depend very much on what kind of application you are aiming for. But those are good ballpark figures. You definitely do not want to go below 1 hertz though, because that messes with all kinds of things. Another thing to consider is that you want to have the rear of your suspension slightly faster in oscillation than the front. That is because when you're driving across a bump, the front hits the bump first and then the rear, which is what you see here in this graph, in the bump graph. What you want to happen is that the rear catches up with the front and then stays with the front. We recommend you keep an eye on these percentages up here for drivability, sportiness and comfort, because there is no setup for any kind of suspension that caters to all at the same time. It is always a matter of compromise. Another matter of compromise are the dampers. You want to set them up such that the damping coefficient, which you see here in this example as 0.31 and 0.29, that they are about equal for front and rear. That can mean very different settings and mostly depends on how much mass is on top of that axle. What this does is dampen these oscillations. So now I've increased it in the rear and you can see that the oscillation flattens out but also becomes a little bit longer. This is a pretty good example for a reasonable setup for drivability. You drive over a bump, it catches up and then stays with the other motion of the suspension. That is pretty comfortable and very drivable. The number shown in here is a fraction of the critical damping coefficient. If this number is 1, then you are exactly at the critical damping coefficient. What that means is that the suspension doesn't have any oscillations which only high downforce race cars would benefit from. Even the most extreme super and hyper cars would probably not go beyond the 0.5 to 0.7 range though, so keep that in mind. This is an example of having the damping coefficient of 1, the critical damping. As you can see, all oscillation has ceased. It just goes straight down to equilibrium, but it doesn't approach equilibrium as fast as the other curve does. Keep in mind that if you change the spring stiffness, you will also change the damping coefficient. As you see here, it was 0.33 or 0.34, and now with increased spring stiffness, it only it remains at 0.22. So I recommend you set up the springs first and then adjust the dampers accordingly. The last part is ride height. And ride height is very important for various things. Maybe you are building a little city car. You think like, ah, oh, it would be awesome to have that super low. People's backs loading in their groceries will think differently. Also, you might spot some red lines on the slider. Those are from your actual suspension choices. 
Independent suspension can be the lowest of them, and the lowest of all would be pushrod suspension. Solid axle suspension, if we are going for that, especially, let's see, in the front, not so much recommended, that means that your car will have to be a lot higher. Now this average setting all of a sudden is the actual minimum we can set it to, but we also can set it to be higher, higher than with the, for example, Macpherson struts. Lowering ride height will also mean that you lower the center of gravity of the car, which results in a lower roll angle. So you can play around with that if you do not want to have too much sway bars on your car. Too much sway bars also means that you get a penalty to your comfort ratings. Because if you're driving over a bump on the right hand side, then the sway bar makes it such that you also feel it on the left, because it is directly connected to the left hand side of the car. Off-road vehicles, unless they have the off-road sway bar option, will benefit from not having any sway bars whatsoever. If you on the other hand choose the off-road sway bars, you can have a reasonable sway bar setting and yet go off-roading because you can disconnect them. Another important aspect of your suspension tuning and especially spring stiffness and ride height in combination is that the more spring stiffness plus ride height you have, the more cargo carrying capacity your vehicle will have. The stiffer and the higher, the more cargo you can carry. This is here indicated by the maximum load capacity. Just make sure that you're not overdoing it, because your tires can only take so much. This also means that it's basically impossible to make really comfortable utility vehicles which need to carry a lot, because if you drive them without the weight on the back, which you can simulate here, well then, then they are not that comfortable anymore, because the ride frequency skyrockets. While nowhere near the complexity of a suspension setup in reality, these options give you a pretty good range of tuning that you can employ in order to make your cars cater to various demographics or your driving needs on the track.